Welcome to Wine Library TV. I am your host, Gary Vayner Chuck, and this, my friends, is The Thunder Show, and this is the episode I've probably been waiting for for a very long time. Elizabeth, you know we've been trying to do something with Blue Ribbon for a long, long time, and on this tour of NYC, we are hitting the Blue Ribbon Downing Street Wine Bar, and I'm super pumped because this spot is not only ridiculously rad all, but they have a really interesting concept because this is a wine bar. We've been doing restaurants, but this is a wine bar, and they do groups, so you can get these little three-section groups, and of course, as soon as I saw, Mott, zone in on me maybe, as soon as I saw at the top, the grower's champagne, given the timing, you guys are emailing me like 50 at a time every day about doing a champagne episode because you've got to ship it before the holidays. I get it, so I'm going to come through two birds, one stone, and we're going to do growing champagne. And I'm here with my man, Sean. Appreciate it, my man. Thank you so much. Thank and you. And we're going to uh, go through the three uh, champagnes that he selected um, and it, for this group and go into them and talk about grower champagne. I think it is time, America. Please, I'm begging you. It is time to stop drinking straight junk champagne. And if you don't think that you're getting tricked, you've got it all twisted. Because Moet and Clico and all that jazz, PJ with the flowers on the bottle, we're tricking you. You're drinking the gallo of champagne. And there's serious stuff coming out of champagne. I mean, if you really roll with serious wine people, at the end of the day, I probably like champagne more than anything else. If I had a really, you know, I love the desert island question, which I have to answer 13 times a day, so I appreciate all the emails. It's always going to be the sparkling, the bubbles. There's an enormous amount of complexity. I actually love the serious red wine cold drinkers that poo-poo on champagne. I drink Camus, my wife drinks champagne. Buddy, she's much smarter and cooler than you. Wake up. So. You know, I'm pumped about the bubbles, as you guys can tell, and uh, let's get into the first wine. Sean, tell me what we're rolling with. It's pointed to the camera. Gas and GK, Blanc de Blanc. All three are Blanc de Blancs, actually. Uh -huh. So 100% Chardonnay. So the Blanc de Blancs, you know, are 100% are Chards. You sometimes see the Blanc de Noirs, which are Pinot Noir-based uh, uh, champagnes. So this is, um, now these are the way you would do the groups? Do you do them in the flutes or do you do them in the regular glass? We do them in the flutes. And that was, uh, that little there, is that the uh, ta glass taste? How, do, how does that roll? This is taste? actually right about the taste. So this is the taste level. And right glass would go right there. So, yep. so you can go glass taste and bottle. It's re I mean, this is really cool. Honestly, if you live in anywhere in Manhattan, heck, if you live in Brooklyn, if you live in Omaha, if you live in Alaska, get your ass down here. This is a great spot. Problem is, is these guys are really cool. Like, actually, I really don't belong here. This is a much more trendy and cooler spot than my cool level. I mean, I don't need, do you got, how many people can you allow into this spot? It's pretty tight. 38? 40? Yeah, that's where you Tops. push it. It must be tight. 40 is yes. like, you know. Yeah. So I'm sure that's how they roll almost every night here. So if you're cool and you look, you know, like that and you roll that way, you need to get down here. So let's let's get into this. What uh what made you so excited about this? Um I love how here, wines by the glass. I love that Blanc de Blancs are just very accessible, you know? They're light, they're refreshing, they get the palate going. So I thought the three of these were exceptional examples of Blanc de Blancs. How many, uh, how many Blanc de Blancs do you think you went through to you know, narrow it down to these three levels? You know, it's tough. Did you do it in one shot or did you do it over time? We rotate, actually. Uh -huh. how so often? if you come in two weeks from now, maybe a different set of Blanc de Blancs. Really? The only mainstay has been the Pierre Peters. Otherwise... Which I think we've done on WLTV and I think people, if you, if you know me, know what I think about this producer. But there are many Blanc de Blancs out there that are really, really high quality. So tell me about the Chicot, what, what really uh, brought, you want to taste along with me? I mean, I don't, I feel like. I think this is like, uh, it's really, it's really, really light. Um, incredibly like structure, you yeah. know? Now what, what I love about this on the snippy sniff level is that you're getting like almond shells, which I love so much with Blanc Blanc. Hey, get, join in. Yeah. Yeah. They, they want you to drink, trust me, I'm sure of it. Um, I'm also getting really pretty vanilla kind of components, and you know what I'm, loving from here is almost a hint of like back-end coconut peel, which is subtle on the nose, which I think is really spectacular. Let's give it a whirl. It's hard for me to spit champagne. It's hard to spit champagne, period. It really just is yeah, hard yeah. to spit champagne. But the way it leaves your mouth, you want another sip. You want an oyster, you want caviar, you want 
you know. Kumamoto is just rolling through my head like left and right right now. This is extremely silky. The creaminess factor on this champagne is extraordinary. It completely coats my palate. It's almost got a viscous component, just a heaviness uh, to this Blanca Blanc that you don't see. Again, this is the difference. The roundness of the apple peel, the lemon zest on the, on the mid palate is so much greater and more profound than you're gonna see in your standard non-vintage champagnes that we're all buying in, in America. Those wines tend to be a little bit, you know, more off balance and acidic. This, the balance here of the acidity and the fruit and the creaminess and the structure and the back end finish is just on a different planet. This is extremely good. And when the bubbles disappear over your tongue, the texture of them is just like... No question. I mean, this Gaston is, uh, is an extremely fine example to me. You know, this is rolling in as an easy 90-point type champagne. Uh, if you have the pleasure of finding this, please write these down. I mean, hopefully the next two will come through hard, but this, this is a producer I'm less familiar with than the next two, and, and I've got to tell you, we're off to a serious start, so let's move on. Pierre Peters, Blanc de Blanc. Now, to give you an example, on the taste level, the first one was 11. Uh, and this is 12, and the last is 10. Um, tell me what you think about uh, Peters and what, what For me, you. and it's me only, I think Pierre Peters is kind of a benchmark for Blanc de Blanc. Sure. When I look for Blanc de Blanc, it's got to like measure up to this. Over the last 24 to 36 months, uh, P Squared has gotten a lot of play on the internets, so it has actually become more of a brand in the champagne world. About three or four years ago, when we were first kind of finding it ourselves at WL, we were just shocked how good it was and how little we knew about it. Then RP down in Maryland, our favorite lawyer who reviews wines, kind of blabbed about it on his website, and it's definitely become a more standard brand that people have uh, have attached to. What I like about that is I do believe all the Vaniacs, and the millions and millions of you are going to be able to find this wine a little bit easier. Let's see what's going on here. Now, right off the bat, there's a little bit more goldenness to the color. Almost like the beautiful locks of Dusty Rhodes 1983 NWA wrestling. That kind of style. So, you like that, right? Uh, let's give it a little bit of a snippy snip. Now, this is a little bit, a, a totally different experience on the nose. This is much more mineral, mineral driven. It's actually Ocean X, you know, it, it smells like, you know, you drank a little too much champagne and you woke up by the beach. Yeah, seashells. Mm -hmm. That's what's really coming through more than anything else. There's also a little hint, almost perfume style, so it's really like seashells and then like kind of walking through Bergdorf's, you know, so kind of interesting. Let's give it a whirl. Toasty, like toast, like right? toast. Yeah, like like almost like cinnamon toast crunch, in a way. Very much like toasted bread, which I love. You get the yeastiness, which is always exceptional. Uh, very clean. Little hint of star fruit on the mid palate, which I'm really enjoying, and it really coats your entire palate. I mean, really, what stinks about this right now is I'd love to have one or two bottles of sparkling wine, champagne from standard stuff. And I think I'll roll that way next week and do a tasting with some of the more standard brands alongside because, you know, when you deal with producers like this, this is gonna come off a little bit rave review-y, but this is really also quite good. Um, it's a little bit more towards my palate. I actually like this style a little bit more. On a recommendation level, I'd probably recommend the first wine to more people because I feel that this stylistically is a more popular style champagne. Very is, accessible. Right? Mm -hmm. This is much more of a very unique style. The breadiness is obnoxious. Sasha Vaynerchuk, my pops who you all love now more than me, this man needs to drink this wine. Because my dad like kind of makes it uncomfortable when we go to restaurants because he eats so much bread that it almost attracts the other patrons to watch him. He's like a freak show circus clown because he eats like 30 pieces of bread. I'm serious, he freaks people out. He eats like, the fr I mean immediately we sit down, he goes, where's the bread? He scares the crap out of him with that Russian accent. You know what I'm talking about, you saw the episode. And then he eats it all and he's like, where's the bread? I mean it's pretty scary. So, this is like bread crust though. It's right? Really that specific. Yeah, I, I think you're bread right. It's definitely bread. not like the middle of like no. white bread. Yeah. And there's a serious level of apples coming on in here. For me, this is a 91 plus point champagne. I'm really feeling it. Again though, you have to know what you're getting yourself into. This is apples and bread. Pretty strict, real high acid, high levels of acid on this. This, I think, is the kind of champagne that I would go and venture into other foods, heavier foods, because I think it brings enough shoulders, enough thunder to compete against food. So, that was good. Awesome.
No wonder it's standard. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, Jean Milan, Blanc de Blanc. Now this is an interesting Blanc de Blanc. Now what gets weird about Champagne and what freaks everybody else is like, for example, ratings are obviously very important. You know, we pee on them, but you know, even though I rate them, ridiculous hypocrite, but I like scores, I'm a sports guy, so don't hate me. But, that being said, um, non-vintage wines are tricky because they do change, but because the vintage doesn't change, people don't really know where you're at. So for example, Wine Spectator could rate a non-vintage wine like a Jean Milan 90 points, and then for like three or four years not rate it, but the wine has been evolving. And the reason I'm bringing that up is, out of all the producers that I love in Grower Champagne, Jean Milan's been the one that I've kind of bounced around with. You know, like there's like two or three years ago, I really loved it. Then about 18 months ago, maybe even last seasons, I was kind of soft on. I don't even know if this is still part of that same batch. We're about to find out. But it's been the one that's kind of you know seesawed on me. So let, let's see what's going on here. What do you what do you think about this producer and your experiences in the past? I think it's big, big structure. And you hit on something earlier with the Pierre Peters. It can you can carry this into a meal. Sure. So this can go way deep into a meal. I think this wine can. With I mean, the structure. really classic nose. Um, I had this with sushi recently, and the riciness of the uh, the rice on the sushi complemented this in Toro perfectly, incredibly well. I want some sea urchin so bad right now. <laughs> I'm just all about it. I mean, um, you know, again, mi kind of acting a little bit similar to the last wine in its, you know, it is mineral driven. It is also a little bit driven by the yeast flavors on the nose. A little bready. Let's give it a whirl. For me, this is the most tropical of the bunch. Definitely. Right? Yep. I mean, this is extremely pineapple juice yep. on the back end. Hints of mango. Um, I like it. Um, it. It's very tropical. Again, a, almost a, definitely a clearly a higher residual sugar than the last two. I mean, this is the lady champagnes as the dudes talk like, give her that, you know, kind of thing. Um, but yes, it is clearly something that is a little bit high. Almost tastes like st some like that new wave starburst fruit. You know, like that kind of flavor. For me, Maybe a little too sugary, a little too fruity. To me, this is good. Um, not on my palate, my style, but don't forget, who gives a crap about my palate? You've got to embrace your palate. I don't, I'm not looking to be the new guy that people listen to. You need to accept and try different things. The only thing I beg you is this holiday season, when you pop into the year 2008, that's ridiculous, by the way. It was like 2000, like 45 seconds ago. When you pop in 2008, that you don't do it, just promise me this, or we'll stop the thunder show. We're gonna spy on you through your computers. No Dom, no Cristal, no Clico, no Moet. What else do you wanna throw in there? Perrier Jouet, Piper Heitzig, even Laurent Perrier, I think, tries to act grower, but it isn't. I mean, try something new. Hopefully the wine shops around you and around the country are gonna carry grower champagnes. To me, this is an 89, 88 point champagne, but let me promise you something. On my internal scale, all the brands that I just mentioned, I mean, we're talking about 84, 82, 79, 76 type champagnes. We're being fed marketed, marketing all the way. Open up Vogue this month. Pay attention to who's advertising. It's not grower champagnes. It's Moet. And so understand where we are. We're America. We're marketing is king. And there's so much great stuff out there. And these are three great examples. Really zoning in on the middle for me. What about for you, honestly? What are what, what's your favorite one of this bunch? <clears throat> Again, Pierre Peters. Is yeah, like for me too. Elegance, right? balance. It's it's a serious, sparkling champagne. We do a question of the day that we ask all the Vaniacs. I'm going to let you ask it. I know on the spot. I didn't even tell you. So, what do you want to ask the Vayner Nation? I want to ask the Vayner Nation your favorite Syrah. What is your favorite Syrah? Because you, with a little bit of me and guys like this, and places like this, please come down here. Twitter me up, I'll meet you here. We're changing the wine.